Hello everyone. Thank you for standing by and welcome to our webinar, Gestational Diabetes, Risk Factors, Screening Methods, and Management Options, sponsored by ISIS Parenting and presented by Dr. Tamara Takutis. My name is Nancy Holtzman. I'm the Vice President of Clinical Content and Online Learning here at ISIS Parenting. I'm also a mother-baby nurse specialist and board-certified lactation consultant. During today's presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. However, you may submit questions to us at any time by typing them in the chat feature located to the left of your screen. We've incorporated many of the already submitted questions into the presentation and will take additional questions at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and you'll receive a link to the recording by email tomorrow along with additional resources. So if you miss something or need to step away for any reason, that's okay. ISIS Parenting is proud to host today's webinar. ISIS is the nation's most trusted prenatal and early parenting destination. We provide innovative programs and a highly selected selection of products for expecting and new families in our four Boston area centers, five brand new centers in the Dallas area, and four new centers in Atlanta, Georgia. Visit our website at isisparenting.com to learn more. As I mentioned, I'm Nancy Holtzman, and I'll be your moderator today. With me today from ISIS Parenting is my colleague, Chris Chest. Chris is a certified nurse midwife with over 20 years of maternity care experience in educational and clinical roles. Chris oversees the clinical component of ISIS Parenting's prenatal education programs and is actively involved with hospital partnerships and community outreach. Our expert today is Dr. Tamara Takutis. Dr. Takutis is a co-founder of Boston Maternal Fetal Medicine, or Boston MFM. She has been practicing high-risk obstetrics at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center for nine years and is an instructor at Harvard Medical School. She is co-director of the Joslin Diabetes in Pregnancy Program. Dr. Takutis participates actively in research to support her interest in diabetes and pregnancy, preeclampsia, and nutrition in pregnancy. She spends her time with her two school-aged children, and she has competed in her first half Ironman triathlon two weeks ago and will compete in a full Ironman triathlon in July. Welcome, Dr. Takutis. Hi, this is Tamara Takutis. Welcome to the webinar. Um, we're going to be talking today about gestational diabetes, and I'm going to use the abbreviation GDM for short multiple times through the presentation. So just not to confuse you, GDM stands for gestational diabetes. GDM is the onset of carbohydrate intolerance of varying severity with first recognition or onset occurring during pregnancy. That is the standard definition that we are currently using for gestational diabetes. Some of the questions that patients will come up with, including why would some women get gestational diabetes, how do I know if I have it, and when am I tested, and why did my friend have different testing than I did? These are some of the questions that we're going to address today. Many patients will worry, will I have a healthy baby if I have gestational diabetes, and a lot of patients fear taking insulin. And of course, very important is can I breastfeed if I have gestational diabetes? And we'll go over these concerns today. First of all, there are patients that definitely have higher risk factors for gestational diabetes. If you have had gestational diabetes before, it does not guarantee that you're going to have gestational diabetes again, but the chances of having it are much higher. If you have a strong family history of type 2 diabetes, if you've had a previous baby that's large, or difficulty with a previous delivery, specifically shoulder dystocia, which is when the shoulders of the baby are slightly stuck behind the pubic bone. These are some risk factors. Most importantly, obesity, age, and your ethnic background certainly have an effect. There are some patients who have medical diseases, including cystic fibrosis and polycystic ovarian syndrome, or PCOS for short, um, that have a higher risk and twins and triplets because of the numbers of the fetuses, meaning more placenta and more placenta hormones, that increases the risk as well. About 5% of all patients will be diagnosed with gestational diabetes, but there is an extremely wide range of populations depending on their risk factors and depending on where we're looking. Numbers of patients are definitely increasing as time goes on based on obesity, their older age at delivery, and depending on how they're screened. Not everyone gets gestational diabetes. 
Most patients may not have any idea that they have gestational diabetes. You will not necessarily have any symptoms of gestational diabetes. Some normal symptoms that patients think might be in association with gestational diabetes and worry that they're having gestational diabetes is if they're incredibly thirsty. This may be a normal symptom of pregnancy. You're, you may not feel any different whatsoever if you have gestational diabetes. Screening needs to be done in order to diagnose. Gestational diabetes happens much later in the pregnancy, typically in the second and third trimester. This is when the placenta is growing and your, the hormones made by the placenta make your body resistant to the insulin it is already making. This is very different than patients who have type 1 diabetes prior to pregnancy where they do not have any insulin that their own body makes, even though patients with type 1 still get insulin resistance. The usual time for testing is done at 24 to 28 weeks of pregnancy when the placenta production is the highest, hence insulin resistance is at one of its peaks. New recommendations suggest that we screen all patients early in pregnancy. Early testing may not be performed by your physician yet because this is a new recommendation, but it should be in the form of either a random blood sugar a fasting blood sugar, meaning a sample that's taken prior to eating, or a hemoglobin A1C. A hemoglobin A1C is an estimate of the average blood glucose over your past three months, and it can reflect higher levels of glucose in your bloodstream even if you don't realize it. Patients often will not know that they're being tested because it's routinely included in the lab work that you have done at your first or second visit. Unfortunately, as you know, this may be a large amount of blood that's being drawn, but you certainly can ask your physician if it's been done. Most patients will have an oral glucose challenge test at 24 to 28 weeks, and high-risk patients may need to have this testing done early with the oral glucose challenge test as well as later in the pregnancy. OGT stands for Oral Glucose Challenge Test. That's a lot to say. <laughs> um, it comes in many forms. Um, what type of testing depends on your doctor. There is two-step testing, which is more traditional, and there's also one-step testing, which is newer and is used widely internationally, but may or may not be done at this point in time by your physician. This is not a cup of beer. <laughs> this is a picture of a 50 gram glucose challenge test. It's the most commonly used in the United States. Uh, orange flavored is the flavor that's depicted here. Um, there are many different types of flavors. You do not usually need to be fasting for this test, but there are some ph physicians, <coughs> um, sorry, um, you don't need to be fasting, although some doctors will ask you to be fasting for this test. The normal values depend on your doctor, and some use the cutoff of 140, and some use the cutoff of 130. If you've undergone this one-step testing and your results are above the 130 or 140 cutoff, then you'll be asked to do a three-hour test. The three-hour test is yet another sugary drink, and it includes 100 grams of glucose, which is double the amount that you just had. You'll be asked to fast for at least eight hours, and then your blood sugar will be checked fasting and at one, two, and three hours. The cutoffs may vary, but if two of these results are abnormal, then you have GDM. If one value is abnormal, this is considered impaired glucose tolerance, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later, because impaired glucose tolerance um, is, is some form of gestational diabetes and it may be treated differently by different clinicians. The newer test that is being done right now currently at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, we converted to this testing in 2010. It's a one-step test. The idea, it looks the same, is a 75-gram drink, um, and you either pass the test or you don't. It's a sugary drink, and you also need to be fasting, at, checked at one hour and two hours. If you have any one value that is abnormal, then you make the diagnosis of gestational diabetes. 
Doctors use different tests for different reasons. The controversy lies in a study that was published called HAPO, H-A-P-O, in 2008. It showed, a mild, it showed that milder glucose elevations increase the risk of large babies, cesarean delivery, and increase fat percentage on these babies. One-step testing programs diagnose more patients with GDM than previous two-step testing. The concern is, does this testing and making the diagnosis in more patients, will it help prevent the problems um, that it's trying to prevent? Currently, there is no consensus yet. So some groups have switched and some have not. If you have a two-step test, as we just discussed in two slides ago, and it's borderline, um, the question of what to do with that is not clear. If you undergo one-step testing, you would not have any borderline results. The results are either above the cutoffs or below. If one value in the two-step testing is abnormal, then no consensus as to the follow-up is clear. Some doctors will make you repeat this test in a month after doing it initially. Some doctors will already recommend dietary changes as well as exercise. Some doctors will treat you just as if you have gestational diabetes, which by itself is not a bad thing because it's similar to the one-step testing where there is not necessarily patients that have abnormal testing that definitely have gestational diabetes. And if there's patients that do have gestational diabetes, it's not always clear where that cutoff should be. You can discuss that more with your physician if, uh, I'm sorry, I just went back to the slide. If you do pass and don't pass one step of the test, you may want to discuss that with your clinician as to what their thoughts, processes, or their reasoning is for doing or treating you as they have recommended. So once you get the diagnosis of GDM, it does not mean you eat too much sugar. The treatment may decrease your risk of a bigger baby, it may decrease your risk of complicated delivery and other problems in the pregnancy that we're going to discuss, including problems after birth. You will usually need to meet with the diabetes team. This consists of usually a nutritionist, a doctor, and in some patients it's either an obstetrician, their own obstetrician, or an endocrinologist, and in some cases also a nurse educator. You'll be given a glucometer, and this will be used to measure your blood glucose. You'll be asked to keep a food diary and log all of your va values daily. Your glucometer will help you see your results, meaning after you eat a meal, if your blood sugars are higher, you'll realize that what you ate or what you didn't eat may or may not have caused that blood sugar elevation. Sometimes this doesn't make sense. You have to check your blood sugar at least four times a day, once before breakfast and one to two hours after meals, but it may be helpful for you to check it more often during the day if you're not feeling well or if you're having um, difficulty um, after a, a snack. The first week is probably one of the most difficult because you're asked to do so many things. You're also learning what types of foods you can eat and what makes your blood sugar more elevated, so you need to be patient. You're still figuring it out. Different centers have different goals for the glucose results. So this talk is not meant to say that these results are the test results that you need to have. You need to discuss it with your physician. However, generally most places use a fasting glucose of less than 90 to 100 and one hour after you eat, 120 to 130. If your baby is measuring large and specifically some centers use the measurement of the abdominal circumference, the goals may certainly be stricter. Some clinicians also use two hours after meals. In general, we use one hour after meals because it's felt that there's more immediate peaks and spikes in the glucose, and then that may be what's causing the baby to be bigger. By testing it two hours after the meal, you may already have missed that spike in the glucose, and that level of glucose already gets to the baby. Hence, one hour testing after meals is probably better than two hours. Sometimes it's very difficult to figure out what to eat, and so your provider will usually outline a meal plan for you. This does not mean that you can only eat things on that meal plan, um, nor does it mean that you have to stick to the strict meal plan. However, sometimes it's helpful to try out different foods in the beginning and realize what will and won't work. 
It's important that you do not eliminate all your carbohydrates. You should not be starving. Initially, you may be afraid to eat because you'll see that sometimes it does raise your blood glucose. Remember that nobody is perfect, and you will have some elevations in your blood glucose. That does not mean that you're doing a bad job. You will be asked to eat certain amounts of carbohydrates for each meal, and you'll be asked to increase your protein and fiber intake. You should be eating at least three meals a day and a healthy snack in between. Having the diagnosis of GDM does not mean that you need to starve. Understanding what you can eat. What works for you may not be the same as what works for a friend. We all have different uh, times in our pregnancy. Somebody who is 28 weeks pregnant may have very different blood sugar values than somebody who is 36 weeks pregnant. You also may be more active or less active than your friends. Also, your weight, if you weigh 200 pounds or if you weigh 150 pounds, this will also uh, change your results. No one, again, has a perfect glucose value, um, but it's most important to keep the majority of them in the goal range, and we usually aim for at least 85%. Weight gain is also extremely important. Sometimes, unfortunately, by the time we have the diagnosis of gestational diabetes, we may have already not gained enough or gained too much weight. So weight goals we're just going to be discussing in the next two slides have to do with weight gain for the total amount of the pregnancy. Many patients may not gain weight, however, after getting diagnosed with gestational diabetes because they're getting used to the diet. Significant weight loss, though, after being diagnosed with GDM is to be avoided. Weight gain for your pre total pregnancy is based on your pre-pregnancy body mass index. Sometimes you may not know what your body mass index is. It is not difficult to find out. You can look on the web and you can check to see what your weight is over how tall you are, and that will give you a BMI. In 2009, the Institute of Medicine revamped the weight gain guidelines. For patients with a normal BMI between 19 and 25, it should be between 25 and 35 pounds for the pregnancy. If a patient is underweight with a BMI of less than 19, the weight gain goals are higher. If you're overweight, meaning BMI between 25 and 30, weight gain goals should be less, between less than 15 up to 25 pounds. If your BMI is above 30 in the obese category, weight gain totals of 11 to 20 pounds, it's important to try to stay within these guidelines. Activity is an extremely important ad adjunct therapy to gestational diabetes. If you're not limited in your activity by your doctor, such as concerns about your blood pressure or preterm labor, even walking for 20 minutes a day after meal can help your values after you eat. If you're already exercising, you absolutely may consider changing the times that you exercise and to change this after a meal to help your blood glucose in order to decrease the chances of needing insulin. This is also a very healthy recommendation in pregnancy. If you already aren't exercising, exercise is very helpful. There are risks of gestational diabetes. Many of these risks absolutely overlap with some of the risks for patients who have diabetes prior to pregnancy. They include preeclampsia, which is high blood pressure and new onset of protein in your urine, extra amniotic fluid, a larger baby, which the word for that is macrosomia, birth trauma, which can include shoulder dystocia and sometimes although rarely, can lead to a neurological injury. Operative vaginal delivery, meaning forceps or a vacuum. Perinatal mortality, which is extremely rare with gestational diabetes, can be very high, especially in noncompliant patients. Neonatal metabolic complications include a low blood sugar or hypoglycemia, hyperbilirubinemia or jaundice, and hypocalcemia in the neonate. One of the most important things after pregnancy is that moms are at increased risk of type 2 diabetes. There is a very high chance that these risks can be prevented or decreased, especially if you follow the diet and the plan carefully. The chances of a larger baby are decreased. If your baby is not large, then the risks of shoulder uh, dystocia and cesarean delivery and birth injury are much lower. 
Chances of jaundice, um, low blood sugar in the baby, are less if your control is good. Breastfeeding absolutely decreases your risk for obesity after the baby and helps you lose weight faster. If you can't control your blood glucose with diet, um, some patients will need insulin. Our most recent data that we have out of the Jocelyn is it's about 50% of our patients require insulin. This does not mean that you failed. It does not mean that you're not following the diet. But it's a sign of increased placenta hormone production. And again, it's very variable depending on your ethnicity, your body weight, and your activity. High after meal glucose values are definitely closely related to larger babies. Insulin does not cross the placenta. Insulin usage or need does not mean that you will take insulin after you've delivered your baby. A lot of patients are afraid of taking injections with insulin. This is definitely something that can help with the treatment of gestational diabetes. It's been used for the longest amount of time out of any therapy for diabetes. Outcomes with insulin are more certain. And insulin comes in a short-acting as well as a long-acting form. Some patients can only use insulin or may only need insulin at nighttime, meaning one dose a day. Some patients will need insulin after each meal. Insulin needles, as shown in this picture on the right, although sometimes it looks bigger, are very small. Injections of insulin are, very, um, are not as painful as most patients think they will be. In fact, most patients find that checking their blood sugars may be sometimes more difficult than giving an insulin injection. The use of insulin and the dosage usually increases the farther along the pregnancy progresses. The amount of insulin that a patient needs is usually at its peak or maximum by about 36 weeks um, and then decreases after 36 weeks. The chances of the um, amount of insulin that you need after 36 weeks being higher um, is low because the placenta hormones decrease. Using oral medications in pregnancy can be done. The strict recommendations from the American Diabetes Association is that insulin alone be used and no oral agents. ACOG, or the American College of OBGYN, recommends that oral agents should, use should be limited because safety has not been assured. The National Institute of Health suggests that metformin can be considered as an adjunct to insulin, and at the Jocelyn, insulin only is used. Very rarely will use oral agents only if insulin cannot be used, such as a patient's um, inability to give themselves the injections. Um, I'm just going to answer a question. It says that insul if insulin does not cross the placenta, um, then what's causing the baby to be large and have hypoglycemia after birth? That is a great question. So insulin is not what crosses the placenta. Um, the high blood sugar in the mother crosses into the placenta, and it's cause, it causes the baby's own pancreas to release its own insulin, so hence the baby will be larger because it's taking in more glucose. The reason the baby will have hypoglycemia after birth is because the baby's blood sugar is low because the baby's pancreas is making large amounts of insulin by itself. And until that becomes regulated, without the exposure to the mom's high dose of insulin, um, that, that can be a problem for the newborn. So let me go back to glibride and metformin. These are the main two medications that are used during pregnancy if oral agents are to be used. And while neither have been shown to cause problems, there may be a higher chance of failure for some patients. Failure may mean delayed treatment with insulin, and by that point in time, it means that the baby may already have grown larger. Even though levels are low or absent in neonates, um, meaning the drug levels of glibride and metformin in the studies that have been performed, um, the long-term effects are not known. Delivery and how one should deliver is very important. The risk of shoulder dystocia is certainly scary. If your baby is larger, it certainly is a higher risk. In this table, Looking at the bottom line, if your estimated weight is more than 4,500 grams in a diabetic patient, the risk of shoulder dystocia is extremely high. The American College of OBGYN recommends a planned cesarean delivery 
if the estimated fetal weight is more than 4,500 grams. Some of the controversy, or most of the controversy, with this slide I am showing above from research that has been done is that this slide is based on birth weight. It is not based on estimated fetal weight. Estimated fetal weight by ultrasound is not perfect. There is a range of error, and an ultrasound, if it suggests that the estimated fetal weight will be more than 4,500 grams, may not be accurate. And ultrasound is less accurate if a patient is larger, and it's also less accurate the larger the baby. That is some of the downsides of counseling patients about the risk of cesarean delivery um, in a larger baby when it's based on an estimate. So in general, fetal testing may be recommended for moms during their pregnancy with gestational diabetes. Non-stress tests, which is depicted here on the left, a picture of a mom hooked up to a fetal heart rate monitor extremely similarly or identical to the monitor that is used during labor and delivery may be considered after 32 weeks, especially in those patients requiring insulin. Usually non-stress testing and fetal testing in general is very controversial in patients over um, 36 weeks and if no insulin is needed or if it is diet controlled. No consensus um, on the use of biophysical profile, Doppler ultrasound, or the frequency of NSTs has been agreed upon in any of the literature or research. Very importantly, doing these tests certainly need to be considered if you consider to do these tests to understand what the follow-up will be after these tests is quite important. GDM itself is not an indication for delivery before 39 weeks. In terms of the time when a mom is on labor and delivery, managing the mother's glucose, this is also in a crucial time for the baby to make sure that the blood sugar is within range. Optimal gl blood glucose should be between 70 and 110. If a patient has never required insulin prior to the time that they present in labor and delivery, insulin should almost never be used. And if a patient's blood sugar is in the goal range, Depending on what stage of labor they're in, blood sugar values may be tested every one to two hours from the onset of labor, and insulin should only be administered if the blood glucose is above 110 repeatedly. And again, caution would definitely be taken in patients who have never been on insulin before. For scheduled patients who have a scheduled cesarean delivery because, for example, they've had a pr prior cesarean delivery and are choosing to have another one, we would usually hold the morning dose of insulin for those patients and check their blood glucose when they present. Very importantly, once the baby's born, the baby needs to be monitored closely. GDM increases the chances of the low blood sugar in the baby, as a previous question had asked. Um, the reasons for that, again, are that the blood glucose of the mother can pass through to the baby, increases the baby's own production of insulin from the pancreas, the baby's releasing pancreas, so when it's born and no longer getting its supply of nutrients through the umbilical cord and the placenta, the baby's blood sugar will drop. This is not something that happens in all babies born to moms with GDM. A normal glucose range for a baby is usually above 40, although some hospitals have different ranges and different cutoffs. And the controversy about what is the exact range that we should administer other therapies for this is unclear. If the baby's initial blood sugar is low, um, it's possible that the baby may need formula, although in some places, it would be reasonable to try a lot of skin-to-skin -skin time to try to increase the baby's blood sugar as well as colostrum. Um, there was an excellent question um, earlier about whether or not it's safe for a mother to pump colostrum prior to the time of delivery and give that to a baby in order to treat hypoglycemia instead of giving the baby formula. And that is absolutely reasonable. Usually after 36 to 37 weeks would be a very safe time in pregnancy to pump that colostrum. The baby is usually checked every hour for a few hours, especially if the initial blood sugar is low. Jaundice is also more common in babies born to moms with GDM. This is in part due to the size of the baby as well as the baby's blood count, which may be higher before delivery if the, baby, if the patient, if the mom, has GDM.
this is a treatable condition, and it's monitored in almost all hospitals for all babies, especially at the 36 uh, hour mark of life, and checked um, if the pediatrician has concerns about the baby's skin color. There are no long-term risks of babies being born jaundice when it's monitored for. Breastfeeding is strongly encouraged. So if you have a diagnosis of GDM and you were not considering um, breastfeeding prior to, after delivery, please reconsider this. Um, it's encouraged for m multiple reasons. Um, it's encouraged especially for the baby, and it's also encouraged for the mother, which we'll talk a little bit more about. If you have had a diagnosis of GDM, it is crucial that you get tested at your six-week visit or right around the six-week mark after delivery with a two-gram Two, sorry, two hour 75 gram test, very similar to the one step testing that we talked about earlier. 30 to 40 percent of women with gestational diabetes will develop over type 2 diabetes in the next 10 to 20 years. You know what? I'm going to apologize. That was a typo. This is actually 30 to 50 percent of women with GDM will develop over type 2 diabetes in the next 10 to 20 years. Contraception itself, um, using while breastfeeding is very important, breastfeeding by itself is not necessarily an adequate form of conception. These are the values listed in this table for normal results of a two-hour 75-gram test at your 75-week visit. A normal fasting level should be less than 100, and two hours should be less than 140. IGT stands for impaired glucose tolerance. That should be between 101 and 125, which means that the mother does not have frank type 2 diabetes, but has a preform, and some patients call this pre-diabetes. The two-hour result is usually between 140 and 199. Diabetes, DM, is a diagnosis is made if the fasting blood sugar is more than 125. If the two hour t if the two hour test is above two hundred, either value counts as a diagnosis of diabetes. How can I prevent the risk of type two diabetes? Breastfeeding is an excellent way to prevent type two diabetes. Weight loss is an excellent way to decrease the risk of type 2 diabetes, and breastfeeding will help you lose weight. Um, being practical about weight loss is extremely important. The first goal after delivery should be to get to your pre-pregnancy weight. After getting to your pre-pregnancy weight, if you aim to lose 7% of your body weight per year, this may definitely decrease the risk of the onset of type 2 diabetes. Even in some patients of different ethnic backgrounds, with a normal body mass index, still aiming to lose a small percent of their body weight will decrease their risk of type 2. Also importantly, let your primary care physician know that you have the diagnosis of um, gestational diabetes during your pregnancy, and your primary care physician should check you yearly to assess your ongoing risks. The most important thing is to understand that GDM is treatable, GDM, if it's well controlled, can decrease the risk for the mother as well as the baby. Diet and exercise may work all by itself. Weight loss and breastfeeding are definitely crucial after delivery to decrease the risk even further. I'd love to take some questions um, that I think we'll have some of our presenters discuss some of the questions that have come up that I didn't answer during the seminar. Thank you very much, Dr. Takudis. Uh, that was excellent, a great presentation. I do have a few questions here from folks. Um, yes. One person said that she has several clients who were diagnosed with uh, GDM. Uh, they were eating well. They had normal glucose levels during the entire third trimester. However, they did have one abnormal result when they were told not to be active after drinking high glucose for the test. So she's wondering, is the test valid for low-weight women who typically don't eat sugar? And even though they, they need to know their glucose, whether or not they're glucose intolerant, do they need to be induced early and have the biophysical profiles? If otherwise, they've been healthy, I guess. Okay, so that's a long question. So let's take it up um, in different parts. The first part, I think, was if a patient doesn't normally ingest or take or eat glucose and then they're taking this test and they don't have, like one of the values is abnormal, but they don't normally eat glucose, is the test still valid? Exactly. 
Okay. So that is a tough question to answer because there are some of our patients that eat so healthy as already. Um, and then taking this test it may seem like a very artificial um, time to take the, a glucose value um, and make a patient have glucose, straight glucose, without protein or any other um, anything else in it, and then they have an abnormal value, and then they get stuck with the diagnosis of gestational diabetes. I would say that it is still a valid test. Um, I do think it's actually really important uh, for patients not to be fasting if they're undergoing the um, the, the two-step testing with the 50-gram test. There are physicians that recommend and clinicians that recommend that patients be fasting for this test. It's actually more likely that their results will be abnormal if they are fasting for that test. So um, I, again, I don't recommend patients to be fasting for the 50-gram two-step testing, the first part of that test. Um, if a patient can't ingest glucose, for example, some of our patients who have had uh, bypass surgery, gastric bypass surgery, those patients can get extremely ill from drinking these drinks. Or if you have a patient that does get nauseated and vomit easily, it would be reasonable to substitute um, having those patients have a fasting glucose um, and then go on, eat a normal meal or breakfast, and then have a one hour after the meal checked. If you do that type of testing, what we tend to recommend is recommending doing that testing at least twice, maybe at 24 and 28 weeks. And if patients are, are high risk, again, to doing that early in the pregnancy but not necessarily having them have the glucose test. Um, so that, I think that hopefully answers some of that first part of the question. Um, That's great. Yeah, thank you. The, the second part of the question has to do with <laughs> um, testing. And I, I think as I, I definitely just tried to point out is that if a patient is on diet alone or if they've just been diagnosed with impaired glucose tolerance, especially if the baby is measuring in a normal range, meaning that the baby is not macrosomic or if there's not too much amniotic fluid, and there aren't other risk factors, meaning high blood pressure or um, you know, that they, they've had other complications like bleeding during the pregnancy, it's reasonable to consider not doing fetal testing for those patients, but I would strongly encourage them to make sure that they can do kick counts, meaning that they feel the baby moving at least 10 times in two hours during one period of the day. That's great. Thank you. Um, and I see just a couple of other questions, and I think we'll, we'll start wrapping up. Um, and I see a couple here. Let's see. Do you restrict the amount of, of carbs in the breakfast meals? Ah, that is a great question. Well, the reason that, uh, that that question is probably being asked is because a lot of patients do find breakfast to be one of the hardest meals of the day. Um, there's a couple reasons. One, it tends that patients have in, much more insulin resistance early in the morning. So some patients do have to resort to restricting their carbohydrates in the morning and eating more protein um, and then waiting until their snack time or lunch time to have more carbohydrates. That's okay as long as a patient isn't struggling with a large amount of ketones, especially in the morning. Ketones usually mean that the patient has not had enough carbohydrates and the body is using alternative uses of fuel such as fat to break down. And we're not really sure what continued or daily uh, ketones mean for a fetus. If a patient uh, needs to have insulin sometimes for just one meal in order to have any carbohydrates in the morning. You know, that's certainly a reason sometimes patients might need it if there's a, you know, you have to eat in the morning. And if no matter what you do, uh, a patient has a high blood sugar, then, then it's reasonable to think about insulin for just one meal. But breakfast tends to be one of the most difficult meals. And I think, unfortunately, most of our American diet revolves around carbohydrates for breakfast anyway, which tends to compound that problem. Right. Um, so would you recommend daily ketone testing? So we generally do do daily ketone testing. I think it's helpful for patients early on in the treatment for gestational diabetes, and I especially recommend it in patients who find that they're losing weight, because um, I find that patients tend to be starving themselves in order to avoid insulin. And if they're checking ketones daily and they have ketones every day, it is likely that that patient actually needs to eat more and needs insulin. And there's another question here. If mom has gestational diabetes, is the child at risk for diabetes? So if a mom is diagnosed with gestational diabetes in pregnancy, there is a higher risk for that child to go on and develop type 2 diabetes in its life, in, in its life later. 
Um, some of that has to do with the fact that the baby may be bigger at birth. So overweight children at birth have a higher lifetime risk of type 2 diabetes, even if mom wasn't diagnosed with gestational diabetes. And that's another reason that we strongly, strongly emphasize breastfeeding, because we think, and there's some data to suggest, that breastfeeding reduces that risk. Great. Um, so I think that's pretty much it for now. I think uh, those, those were uh, the, you know, I consolidated many of the questions. And uh, that was excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, we we want to make sure that everyone is aware that we have uh, webinars archived on our website, and we offer about two live per month. And we look forward to having you attend those in the future. I want to thank Dr. Takutis for that excellent presentation, uh, Nancy Holtzman for typing in the chat room, and this is Chris Just. And we want to uh, wish you a, a pleasant rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye.